Hey everyone, welcome to Terminal Tinkering. I'm Jeff Butts from the Mac Observer, and this is the podcast where I find new uses for older Mac computers, hack away at PCs and Macs, and tinker with electronics. In this episode, I'm going to talk to you about finding newer, more secure, and more modern operating systems for that older Mac, like your PowerBook G4 or your Power Mac G5. I'll also tell you about Valtor, the Mac Observer Hackintosh. And we'll finish the episode out by looking at two different ways you can record your iOS device on your Mac. So let's go ahead and dive in. First, I want to talk about older Mac computers. Um, I'm thinking like your G4, your G5, maybe even a G3. Now, Apple hasn't supported the PowerPC architecture since OS X Leopard. 10.5.8 was the last version of OS X that supported PowerPC, and that was eight years ago in August 2009. So you can just imagine how many security holes it has in it now. The good news is, is that you do have other alternatives. There's other operating systems you can install, and we'll go over some of those. Now, I started this project playing with the PowerBook G4 by installing Linux. I caught a lot of flack for that. People gave me a hard time asking why I didn't go with some flavor of BSD, which kind of makes sense. Um, you know, since the Apple operating systems we have now are based on BSD, it, it would have made sense to start with BSD, but Linux was what I knew. That's what I went with. And by the time I'm done, I think you'll understand why I'm still not ready to throw BSD on there and have that be my operating system of choice. So let's get going and talk about Linux. There are four major flavors of Linux that are still around and offer at least some PowerPC support. No, Yellow Dog isn't one of them. That, that project was pretty much abandoned about five years ago. Your major choices now in the Linux world are Debian, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, and Gen2. Don't rush to write down the links that I'm going to put on the screen. I will include those in the show notes. Here's the bad news. Debian has dropped PowerCC support as of this year. Since Ubuntu is based on Debian, that means you won't see updates for that one on PowerPC much longer either, if there's any updates at all. But if you want a version of Linux that's up to date as of right now and is a relatively easy distribution to find and install, then Debian Jesse and Ubuntu are good choices. Both of these, as I said, are easy installs and you can get to a graphical desktop pretty quickly. Uh, Debian is available from Debian.org. The, they have a dedicated web page for their PowerPC support. Ubuntu is at Ubuntu.com. If you go to Ubuntu.org, you get something vastly different, so don't go there. Ubuntu.com. And they also have a PowerPC web page dedicated to that. The next choice is OpenSUSE, both its Leap and its Tumbleweed variants. I really like Tumbleweed because it's bleeding edge and it looks like PowerPC support might stick around here a bit longer. Now this one does require a bit more tinkering than Debian and Ubuntu, and you don't get a graphical desktop right away like you do with, with the other two. But OpenSUSE.org is their main webpage. And they have split pages for Tumbleweed and Leap. Leap is more stable, and Tumbleweed is a rolling release, so every day it's a new release. Their PowerPC portal page is available, and I'll give you that link as well. And then we'll talk about Gen 2. Now, if you really love to tinker and you've got time on your hands, this is probably the distribution with the best PowerPC support. Um, the main drawback is that almost everything other than the base operating system, on PowerPC at least, you'll probably have to compile it from source. Some binary packages might be available, but most things you will have to compile. If you're looking for a quick install with a graphical desktop right off the bat, this, eh, this ain't it. But if you've got time on your hands, this is quickly becoming my favorite. Um, partially because I've got a lot of experience with it. It was one of the first flavors of Linux that I used for running servers. And it's very, very, it's very customizable. 
So that's Linux. Now let's talk about BSD. Now, you'd think, since Macs are running a custom flavor of BSD, that there'd be strong support for PowerPC here. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. In fact, the BSD variants I've tested so far have almost all turned out to be nearly complete failures. I don't think I have yet to get a graphical desktop installed on any of them, uh, and that's even though I've tried for weeks. I know it's got to be possible, I just haven't found the right magical formula yet to make it happen. With that said, if you're looking for a console-based server, um, BSD might be the way to go. I've had no problems at all with BSD running in, in console mode, in text-only mode. And PowerPC support for that use is still pretty strong, and it's continuing to be developed. If you want to try BSD, here are the three main variants that have PowerPC support. There's FreeBSD, which may be the oldest out there, and they have a dedicated PowerPC project webpage that gives the, the status of FreeBSD on the PowerPC. Latest news hasn't been updated in quite a while because they've had new versions come out since then, but it does give you links to download the ISO image and get that installed. Next is OpenBSD. This one, it's it's just uh, the 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 idea behind OpenBSD is to keep everything open and transparent, and to make as much of the software on it open as well. Um, I did have I did have some success with OpenBSD, but not for the graphical interface. So, you know, there, there's that. They have their own Mac PowerPC support page that gives the history of it, current status, and I think it's pretty up to date. They tell the supported hardware, and uh, down near the bottom of the page, they should give unsupported hardware and possibly, yep, getting and installing OpenBSD. It gives known problems. It gives information about other features and how things will and will not work. So there's that. Next is NetBSD. Just another branch of BSD. And this is the one that is at 7.1. And their PowerPC support page, which gives instructions on how to get it, how to install it. And NetBSD actually has the most comprehensive install document that I've seen for BSD. The only downside to this is that it's a little bit outdated. My Power Mac G5 has Open Firmware 4.0, and this only goes to Open Firmware 3. So there's that. But most of the information is still applicable and still works. Okay, so that's BSD. My somewhat final verdict is that I still prefer Linux, but I'm going to keep tinkering with BSD until I get something right. That's just what I do. Okay, let's switch things up a bit and talk Hackintosh. Now, if you don't already know this, a Hackintosh is a non-Apple PC that's running Mac OS or OS X. It's definitely a bit harder than it sounds because, well, you know, Apple doesn't want you to do it. And that might be why it appeals to me. I avoid warranties, as you might have heard me say before on other podcasts. Now, to build a Hackintosh, you've got two choices. You can buy a computer that closely matches what Apple builds, or you can piece together your own. I've tried both routes. I've done both routes. Because I love to tinker, uh, my latest project, I pieced together my own. That takes a fair bit of research, so I did that, and I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the folks at Tony Mac x86, as well as Insanely Mac, along with folks in the Hackintosh subreddit on Reddit. Again, links in the show notes. Anyways, here's what I came up with. Valtour, the TMO Hackintosh is running off of a Gigabyte Z170X UD5 motherboard. 
He's got an Intel Core i7-6700K CPU. That's a Skylake processor if you're keeping notes. Valtor has 32 gigabytes of Ballistics Extreme memory, a 1 terabyte M2 SSD from Crucial, and a 10 terabyte Seagate Barracuda Pro SATA drive for extra space. The motherboard has an Intel HD530 graphics chipset built in, but I also got a gigabyte AMD RX 460 video card. This is all plugged into my 32 inch AOC display, and right now it's running High Sierra Public Beta 3. When I picked that RX 460 video card, to be honest, I thought it would work great out of the box. That's actually a chipset that Apple has used pretty recently, so I figured it would be well supported. I was wrong. Yeah, Apple used it, but they must have had their own custom video ROM because I found out that the OEM cards have a funny little problem. What you have to do to get this to work is have an integrated graphics card or graphics chipset configured as the primary in your motherboard's BIOS. Then you have to boot blind. And by that, I mean you have no video at all from that AMD card until Mac OS hits the desktop or the login screen. And that's a little bit nerve wracking. I find myself wondering, is this gonna be the time when Valtor doesn't boot up? But so far, so good. Now, when I did the install, I had to use the Intel integrated chipset for that installation of Mac OS Sierra. Once I had that working, then I could switch over to the Radeon, and other than booting blind, it works great. I don't need any third-party drivers. I've got full video acceleration right out of the box. Now, I've heard someone say that you can actually flash the video ROM on the RX 460 to make it closer to Apple specs. I haven't tried that yet, but I'm researching it, and it may be coming in the future. All right, that's enough about Hackintosh for right now. In future episodes, I'll dive into more about the Hackintosh, including how you can get it up and running. Uh, for example, how do you create an install disk so that uh, you can get it installed because you can't just boot off of a regular OS X install disk. Apple doesn't even provide them anymore. So I'll talk to you about how to do that. Um, other tips and tricks, other tools that you can use to get everything working and running properly. For right now, let's switch to a real Mac and talk about recording your iPhone or your iPad screen. Well, okay, when I say real Mac, I mean any Mac, whether it's an Apple Mac or a Hackintosh, because these tools will work on both of those. There's a free way that you can record your iOS device screen, and there's a paid way to do it. Uh, I have my preference for the paid way because it offers more bells and whistles and a little bit more stability. But if you don't want to spend any money on it, you just need to do it once in a while. Here's how you go about it. You plug your iPhone or your iPad into your Mac. And then you fire up QuickTime Player. So I'll fire up QuickTime Player. Click on File, New Movie Recording. And it takes a moment. Now, in this case, it went straight into my iOS device because I had already set it up that way. But basically what you're looking for, usually this will show you your webcam. And you'll look at yourself and you'll think, that's not what I want to record. That's not what anybody wants to record. Oh, oh wait, that's what I think. Um, yeah. So there's a little downward facing arrow, a little downward facing triangle next to the record button. If you click on that, once your iPhone is plugged in, make sure it's unlocked. You should see your iOS device, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad, listed. Click on that. Mine is called Pippin. And then for microphone, if you want sound from what you're recording, click on that as well. With that done, QuickTime will be set up to make your recording for you. Okay, next, there are several paid apps that do the same thing. These guys offer some extra bells and whistles though, and I've got a favorite, and that's Reflector. I use it almost every day for my articles over at App Advice. With Reflector, what you do is you go into AirPlay Streaming on your iOS device. I'm on iOS 11, 
might look a little bit different if you're still in iOS 10. Um, once you get into your control panel, you go to screen mirroring and you see I've got Valtra selected. And so my iOS screen is, is being recorded or is being streamed to my Mac through Reflector. Once you do that and you've got it connected, Reflector screen shows up and shows your iOS screen. Now you can, one of the really nice features of Reflector is you can record your iPhone with a mock-up around it, with a frame around it. And you can even choose different colors for that frame. So let's choose the product red edition. And so now I can record my iPhone and I can have it set up so that the, the frame goes around it and it looks like it's a product red iPhone. Pretty cool, right? I'm gonna go back to Jet Black because that's what I have. So that's what I usually record. Okay, so once you've got it set up the way you want it, you click record. It starts recording your iOS screen. You do whatever you wanted to do. And once you're done, you click on stop record. And you'll get an MP4 file that you can then save it. You can send it to YouTube, use it in the App Store, or whatever you want to do. Honestly, I don't know why more developers don't do this. The app is cheaper than dirt, it works like a charm, and it creates gorgeous videos. Oh well. When you're done, you stop mirroring, and Reflector just flits into the background and it's ready for you later on. Okay, that's all we've got time for today. If you've got any comments or suggestions, just shoot me an email at jeffb at macobserver.com or tweet me on Twitter. I'm at Clefmeister in the Twitterverse. Until next time, happy tinkering.